as somebody getting quite quite a bit older, I think about history and where is the evidence of our lives? Where is it stored? Is it stored anywhere? And it's important to store that because we have to learn is from it? ourselves. <laughs> Does I, I it matter that that I or you spend a life here on this planet and there's no evidence that we were here? Uh, it's a hard question. I'm Donna Eschenbrenner. I'm the archivist here at the History Center in Tompkins County. Several years ago, one of our former directors described the History Center as Tompkins County's attic. I like that analogy. It really hones in on the fundamentals of what we do here at the History Center. Think about what a family preserves in their family attic. You know, a great-grandmother's wedding dress, a grandfather's pocket watch, family letters, photographs, scrapbooks the kinds of things that tell the story of the family. Well, what we do here at the History Center is analogous to that. It's the same thing only on a community-wide level. We preserve the material culture of all of Tompkins County's families, all of Tompkins County's history. As archivist, I manage the archives and the research library and all the collections. We came into this space with a very large collection we love this building. This is still a relatively new building for us. Um, we've only been here for about eight months. It's beautiful. It's historic. The location is fabulous, and we love it. But it's not big. And the only way we were able to make this smaller space work was by investing very heavily in what are called movable shelves. If we set up regular shelving, like library shelving or archi archival shelving, we could not have managed in this space. But what enabled us to do it is these. These actually will move. And what it enabled us to do is fit the very large collection of materials that we have. Scrapbooks, photographs, maps, newspapers, manuscript collections, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of linear feet of paper materials that document the history of the county. I think one of the Treeman family who was editor of the Ithaca Journal. Right. And there's a whole piece of, have you run across this? No. My wife's family uh, would vacation up in northern New Hampshire. Her parents actually moved there. And the local weekly there, which is still in business, would report things like people visiting the local McDonald's for lunch. Uh, nothing like that happened here. It was local news, but actually covered by reporters. Just starting in the early 1970s, there began to be a couple of local weeklies, one of which was called the Grapevine, and another of which was called the Good Times Gazette. Um, and that paper combined with uh, a paper called the New Times from Syracuse, to become the Ithaca Times, which is still in business to this day. The grapevine, I'm afraid, is long gone, but I wrote for it. And they would cover entertainment mostly, uh, music acts and other things coming to town, and write about that, write about local restaurants. I reviewed restaurants. I began to review, to some extent, the wine industry because I had a relative working in that. My first job in Ithaca was actually pruning grapevines in February, which is a tough piece of work. But that became news as well. And going way back, uh, there was all kinds of local coverage back around the turn of the 20th century, I think. And before that, newspapers were really different. If you look back on some of the historical copies that we have here at the History Center, you'll see that news coverage was really different in the 1800s. We have newspapers dating back to about 1817. That's more than 200 years old. That's a, around the time of the founding of Tompkins County. So these are things that are very important to research of all kinds. A local newspaper from 1817 can tell you so much about the life of a community at that time. Journalism throughout the United States, probably throughout the world, is in a state of flux. Local newspapers are dying. Um, news sources are becoming more and more diverse. And what what I'm seeing here as an archivist, um, more and more people are relying on newspapers, paper papers, the real old fashioned news from the past to research local history. Unfortunately, the kind of paper that's been used in newsprint for many, many years is not resilient at all and it breaks down, it deteriorates, it's very acidic.
We're seeing other venues of information and story sharing emerge primarily through social media. You know, saving newspaper articles and preserving obituaries and death notices, things that have long been staples of how you collect and preserve a community history and share stories. Well, what about people who worked in local stuff in 1980 or 1990? What is the record of them? I did a radio show, and a lot of that was recorded as MP3s on CDs. Most of those, who's going to play them? <laughs> you know, we, we, we went through uh, VHS tape, pretty much all gone, if the tape itself can survive. Uh, there were multi-track audio tapes of famous rock groups that are totally unplayable or can be played once by baking them in an oven at a low temperature. And then you get one chance to play them and copy them to something else, and then it's gone. But there are archives of these local weeklies that you can look up. And um, the evidence for what people were doing turn up both in the stories and in letters to the editor which people would write in commenting on the stories, and that's where you find the evidence. Otherwise, we don't have much. Right. Then again, we don't have much from George Washington, except he wrote a lot of letters, and people don't do that anymore. They write emails or Twitters or something like that, and are those archived anywhere? I think one of the, the biggest challenges for us in the next five, ten years is the move towards digitization. We're seeing pressures from granting organizations and from community members that there is the expectation that uh, the materials in our archives, the stuff that we take into our collections, should be accessible online because that is often now where people's first point of engagement with. And so I think that is something that mirrors trends in the journalism field. More and more people are expecting news stories to be accessible online through their phones um, instead of arriving in their mailbox in the form of a newspaper in the morning for breakfast. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and working together about, okay, when stories, narratives, um, important events happen in the community uh, and journalists and news organizations are putting that content online. Is there a way to stream that collection so that it can be archived and digitized in a way that is valuable for us as a history museum and then also for future generations coming in to use our archives for research work? When I started working here, I started here as a volunteer working for the gentleman who was archivist at the time. And the first time he handed me a collection of documentary materials to process, I was kind of awe-stricken, you know, he was handling, it was a collection of um, uh, business records from a, a local store, and he showed me a receipt from 1878, and I thought, okay, somebody 120, 30 years ago was holding this, documenting this purchase, you know, of, you know, several barrels of, you know, wheat. Those people are gone but I have their information here and I can pass it on. And that resonated with me. That really resonated with me. One of the things that we try to do here as educators, we're not just preservationists, but we're also here to encourage access and use of all these materials. One of the things that I try to do as much as possible is teach people, students especially, it's how to get into that imaginative exercise of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, what was life like? That knowledge is not just some esoteric, you know, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, unimportant thing. It's, it's critically important. Knowing where we've been, knowing what we've had, knowing what our community was like informs what we have now. And it helps inform us to see where we're going to be going in the future. Arts and culture in local history specifically is the connective tissue that binds this all together. Um, and when you don't have that, it, there is a detrimental impact on the communities. It is one of the, the key indicators for sort of community health and wellness. Only by dint of luck is any of this stuff preserved. You know, you, you can't tell. But I have hopes that some will survive. There's so much. Mm -hmm.